his series of what happened to national liberation. Uh, we heard yesterday uh, some, some, uh, some things about what happened uh, to national liberation. And, uh, Michael talked about the paradox of national liberation in India, Israel, and uh, Algeria, and in particular focused on pulling apart, first exposing and then beginning to pull apart the, the tension between aggressively secular national liberation movements and what was left in their, in their path-dependent wake uh, some years later, uh, and in particular virulent uh, challenges to the very secularism uh, that motivated those movements. And today he is going to, I think, illustrate in more depth the paradox and the many dimensions of it in his second lecture called Zionism Against Judaism. And just uh, to uh, preview next week, of course, there'll be the third and fourth of these lectures. I did neglect to say that the Stimson lectures are co-sponsored by the Macmillan Center and Yale University Press, which will eventually uh, publish these lectures. Um, but the, so the third and fourth next week, same time, same place, will be on Wednesday at 4 and Thursday at 4. But today we're going to uh, listen to the paradox illustrated, Zionism against Judaism. Thank you. Okay, so this is, as Ian said, um, an effort to illustrate uh, the argument in some depth. And um, I will uh, next week uh, consider a, a rather tough critique of the argument, of my argument, from, a, from Marxist and post-colonial perspectives, and, um, and then talk about what might lie ahead for national liberation. Uh, Zionism is one of the success stories of the 20th century national liberation movements. The first generation of Zionist leaders proposed the solution to the Jewish question that seemed to just about every realistic Jew and non-Jew in the world impossible to realize, and the next generation realized it. The realization came too late for most of the Jews of Europe. It, was, it is darkened by the greatest catastrophe in Jewish history. Nonetheless, Zionism reached the unreachable goal that Theodor Herzl set for it within the 50-year time span that he envisioned. The Zionist movement established a sovereign state in which Jewish self-determination, impossible for almost 2,000 years, is now an everyday fact. So why isn't that the end of the story? Everything after is post-Zionist. What we should talk about now is Palestinian national liberation. But the Zionist story is more complicated than that brief telling suggests, and it is complicated in much the same way as the victories of the Indian National Congress and the Algerian FLN. The Zionist project isn't entirely a success, and it hasn't reached its end. What I called in my first lecture the paradox of national liberation has its specifically Jewish version, which is my subject today. Imagine that a group of the Zionist founders found themselves in contemporary Israel, a ghostly Congress discussing the history of the, of the movement. Most of the people attending, I think, wouldn't believe that their project had been fully realized. The state as it is today would not match their visions. Even the political Zionists, who were often said to want nothing but a state, any state, anywhere, had in fact a particular state in mind, and Israel isn't quite that kind of state. It also isn't the kind of state that the Mizrahi rabbis, the small number of Orthodox rabbis who supported the Zionist movement, it isn't the kind of state that, that they had in mind. But I'm going to focus on the expectations and disappointments of the others, 
because Zionism was at its center and in the years of its greatest achievements, overwhelmingly a secular project. That's what makes its relation to Judaism so interesting. I propose to look closely at that relationship, taking it as a special case of a tension or a contradiction that could be illustrated also in the histories of India and Algeria. And since this further case is bound to come up in the case of Palestine too, which even before statehood has its own history of secular nationalism and religious revival. The Jewish version of the story begins with exile. Over some 2,000 years, a span of time that our imaginations cannot easily encompass, the stateless and scattered people of Israel developed a religious political culture that was adapted to statelessness and scatteredness. I don't know how long it takes to develop a culture of that kind. We can find signs of the adaptation very early on, but the social construction of exile as the prototypical Jewish condition took many centuries, and the construction is very powerful. This is the deep architecture of Jewish life. Judaism as it existed in the late 19th century when Zionism was born was a religion of exile. A yearning for return to the long lost homeland played an important part in that religion. The idea of political independence played no part at all. The Jewish people have forgotten, wrote Leo Pinsker in his pamphlet, the early Zionist pamphlet, Auto Emancipation, the Jewish people have forgotten what political independence is. Exilic politics had only two aspects. First, Jews submitted to Gentile rule. They practiced the politics of deference. And second, they waited patiently for divine redemption. They practiced the politics of deferred hope. In fact, there's a lot more to say about the actual political experience of the Jews, but it is only this dualism that is reflected in their law and literature. Jewish submission would last until the coming of the Messiah, and the coming of the Messiah was in God's hands and seemed to be indefinitely postponed. Deference and deferment, the words and practices that this politics required had to be reinvented in each diaspora setting, but this was in no sense a makeshift invention nor would it be right to say that it was reluctantly accepted. It was indeed the natural politics of the Jews in the eyes of the Jews themselves. The necessary consequence, so it was commonly thought, of the place that God had assigned them in world history. It follows then that any political effort to escape from the exile any nationalism aiming at statehood and sovereignty would have to be the work of people who rejected this divine assignment, who broke with the culture of deference and deferment. But since this culture was a central part of Judaism as it existed in the 19th century, Zionism was and could only be the creation of people who were hostile to Judaism. Uh, if pressed, I will qualify that remark in various ways, but in its naked form, unqualified, it helps to explain a centrally important Zionist goal, the negation of the exile. The negation of the exile. This is not the same as the end of the exile. Of course, Zionists wanted to bring the exile to an end, but they also believed, or many of them believed, that it would be impossible to do that without first negating the cultural predispositions and habits, the mentality of the exile. It was necessary to overcome the long-term adaptation of the Jews to their captivity among the Gentiles, and the name of that adaptation was Judaism. This overcoming could find support within the Jewish world, but its most prominent and successful advocates were likely to be Jews who had assimilated into the world of their oppressors and who viewed their own people with a foreign eye. 
Herzl was a nationalist leader of exactly that kind who wanted the Jews to have a state like any European state. The Zionist dream of normality is born out of persecution and fear, but it also has two intellectual sources, both of them at odds with exilic culture. The first is a close-up knowledge of the other nations, and the second is the belief that imitation of those others is both possible and desirable. Herzl indeed imitated the most progressive European ideas, especially with regard to the status of women, an issue I spoke about last time. In his Zionist Utopia, The Old New Land, published in 1902, women have equal rights with men and are obligated like men, exactly like men, to do two years of national service. Herzl didn't explicitly set this equality against traditional Judaism's exclusion of women from all public roles, but it's an obvious challenge to the tradition. Leaders like Herzl or Max Nordau, his most prominent intellectual supporter, have few anxieties about the negation of the exile because nothing in their experience suggests that there is value in what is being negated. They have no sentimental ties to the old way of life. And this may be the key to their effectiveness. They are single-minded in pursuit of their goals. But this same alienation from the people they mean to rescue can also bring down the leaders of a national liberation movement, as the Uganda episode suggests in Herzl's case. I can't tell that story here, but it's probably sufficiently well known so that I can discuss it very briefly. It began in 1903 when a British colonial official suggested that a large tract of territory in East Africa, what is now Uganda, might be made available for Jewish settlement in lieu of Palestine, instead of Palestine. Herzl was eager to accept the offer, which represented the first official recognition of the Zionist movement as a territorial claimant. He apparently had little sense of the opposition it would arouse. Zionist leaders closer to their people understood immediately, instinctively, that this was negation gone one step too far. However desperate the condition of the Jews, and the Uganda debate unfolded immediately after the Kishinev pogrom in, in Russia, however desperate the condition of the Jews, a specifically Jewish nationalism could have only one country as its object, the land of Israel. These leaders who opposed the Uganda project, most of them Russians, wanted to acknowledge the British offer with gratitude and then reject it, which is what happened three or four years later after Herzl's death. In a curious way, the idea of settling Jews in Uganda under British rule was simultaneously too radical and too conservative. Its radicalism appealed to some secularist and socialist Zionists who worried that the mystique of the land of Israel would make the work of cultural transformation more difficult or perhaps defeat it entirely. Their argument was forcefully stated in a way that resonates today by Hillel Zeitlin, who said, the same tradition that burdens us in the diaspora will burden us a thousand times more in the land of Israel because that is its home. The rabbinic dominion over the masses will not be weakened there as the free-thinking Zionists hope, but on the contrary, will get stronger and stronger. Uganda, or at least the idea of Uganda, offered a new beginning, a chance to establish national life on a modern footing. At the same time, however, Ugandan settlement would also be a continuation of the exile and the subjection it entailed. The new rulers would certainly be more benign than the old. The king of, Israel, the king of e England, the king of England was far preferable to the Russian czar or the Turkish sultan. 
but he was not King David. He did not represent Jewish sovereignty. And that may be why the Mizrahi rabbis were so comfortable with Herzl's scheme. They would not have to face the challenge of sovereignty. At one of the earliest Zionist meetings, the Katowice Conference in 1884, an Orthodox delegate from Romania argued against political independence for reasons that may seem trivial to contemporary secular Jews and non-Jews, but in fact go to the heart of the conflict between Zionism and Judaism. No state, he said, can maintain itself without a postal service, railways, and the telegraph. And these have to be operated day and night throughout the week. But, I'm quoting now, if the officials of Israel were to rest on the Sabbath according to the laws of Moses, other states would protest. While if we were to permit our officials to violate the Sabbath and the festivals, our brethren would rise up and destroy us. And that says nothing about the maintenance of gas and soon electricity services, firefighting, the police, the ordinary functioning of hospitals and clinics, and much else. In the lands of the exile, all this necessary work was done on the Sabbath by Gentiles. In Uganda, the British presumably would arrange for it to be done. It was not yet imaginable to religious Jews that they could do it themselves. In their private lives, they relied on a figure called the Shabbos Goy, a Gentile friend or neighbor or servant who performed all the necessary chores forbidden to Jews on the Sabbath. And what was the state? What else could it be in pre-Messianic times but a large-scale Shabbos Goy? I doubt that Herzl ever worried about the possible incompatibility of the laws of Moses and a Jewish state. His visionary description of a state where, as he said, the army stayed in its barracks and the rabbis in their synagogues did not include the laws. From a political standpoint, the sacred geography of the Jews should have worried him more, but he had little sense of that either until the, Oga the Uganda controversy erupted. Accounts of his conversations with British officials suggest that he argued for as much autonomy as he could get in a Ugandan setting. The setting itself was of less importance to him. And yet, sacred geography was one feature of exilic culture that, as it turned out, neither he nor any of the other Ugandans, later they called themselves territorialists, could negate. The cultural Zionists, followers of Achar Ha'am, opposed the Uganda plan and sharply criticized Herzl's lack of Jewish culture and learning, even more his insensitivity to Jewish emotional attachments. They regularly insisted on the need for continuity with the past, and a few of them, like the poet Chaim Nachman Bialik, aimed consciously at a critical engagement with, rather than a negation of, the exile. Bialik's call for a cultural ingathering, alongside or even before the demographic ingathering, suggests the road not taken, which I will want to defend later on as the better path. Achar Ha'am himself sharply attacked Zionist writers who understood the whole of Jewish history, as he said, to be one long mistake that requires immediate, complete rectification. Though he acknowledged in a private letter that Zionism may involve a latent contradiction with Judaism deep within the soul, he consistently opposed what he called defiant apostasy. Nonetheless, his own ideas about continuity were selective, focused mainly on prophetic morality, and the ideas of many of his followers and admirers were more selective still. Zionism, wrote Leo Motzkin, is in no sense a direct continuation of the ancient culture. Even though it means to refashion something rather than create something ex nihilo, argued Joseph Klausner, Zionism is a highly radical Jewish movement. It aspires to a total revolution in Jewish life, to a revolt 
against the diaspora. And the chief object of that revolt was religion itself. Though some of the, some of the rebels would have said that they were opposed only to its decadent, exilic forms, in Martin Buber's words, to the subjugated spirituality and the imposed tradition drained of its meaning. Like Buber, many of the cultural Zionists, and later the socialists too, looked for inspiration to biblical Israel. Here was a culture of kings, warriors, and prophets that they could hope to continue. But the biblical heroes, as they were described in Zionist literature and propaganda, seemed to be the exact opposites of contemporary Jews, and their creed was very far from contemporary Judaism. It nourished strong men and women, whereas the religion of exile in Zionist eyes produced political passivity and resignation, a slave mentality that was incapable of resistance or self-help. To turn to the Bible was to acknowledge or break a cultural chasm. It is not in our power, declared Israel Kagan, a leading Orthodox rabbi, as if in illustration of the Zionist thesis, it is not in our power to repair the condition of our people because we are under the domination of our enemies. Statements like that were taken by Zionist writers to represent the lack of national self-respect and self-confidence <coughs> of political initiative and unity produced by years of exile and religious resignation. But Kagan would have said that domination was God's decree and that there were other sources of self-respect than political strength. The gap between these views was very wide, and it wasn't easy to find continuity. Sometimes the Zionist critique was less doctrinal and more immediate, as when writers, mostly very young, attacked the turning away from physical activity and from the natural world that marked exilic life. Indeed, the anti-Semitic stereotype of the pale, stooped Jew is also a Zionist stereotype. And Zionist writers had no difficulty identifying physical and mental weakness, stooped backs, and warped minds. Those warped minds and the specifically intellectual qualities bred by centuries of subjection frequently provoked Zionist anger. Achad Ha'am railed against, I'm quoting now, the lack of unity and order, the lack of common sense and social cohesion, the narcissism that holds such terrible sway over the prominent members of the people, the thrill of showing off and the arrogance, the tendency always to be too clever. This kind of diatribe has many counterparts in other nationalist and revolutionary movements. I cannot resist the comparison, possibly unfair to Achar Ha'am, with Lenin's critique of Russian intellectuals. He charges them with slovenliness, carelessness, untidiness, unpunctuality, nervous haste, the inclination to substitute discussion for action, talk for work, the inclination to undertake everything under the sun without finishing anything. The list of complaints is, is different, but the tone is very much the same. And I don't think that these two men, for all their differences, would have had much difficulty agreeing on what they disliked in their contemporaries. So Zionism was marked simultaneously by a deep commitment to the Jewish people and by an equally deep commitment to the transformation of the Jews. These youngsters, wrote Aaron Eisenberg, a moderate religious nationalist. These youngsters are frantically opposed to our traditions, which have been sanctified by the people. And yet they claim that everything they are doing is intended to save the people. And some of them even say that the people cannot be saved unless they, the youngsters, first destroy everything the people have built with their blood. Destroyed and saved saved but destroyed. Let me illustrate this, the transformation these militants hoped for with a list 
of contrasting pairs of cultural values and attitudes which might be labeled from and to. Passivity, activity. Fearfulness, courage. Deference, pride. Obedience, rebellion. Weakness, strength. Indoors, outdoors. Peddlers and shopkeepers, farmers and workers. Subordination of women, gender equality. Dependence, independence, subjection, citizenship, isolation from the world, engagement with the world, fear and hatred of the Gentiles, equality and friendship with them. I can't deal with all these contrasts, and perhaps I don't have to, since the paired items form a coherent and more or less self-explanatory whole. Many Jewish intellectuals and professionals in the West believe that the transformation represented by the second term in each of the pairs required only emancipation, civic equality in the lands of the exile. Jews would become British or French or German citizens and then lead normal lives. They would be liberated, as it were, in place. They would leave the ghetto, but not the diaspora. And then they would be active, proud, strong, and so on. And if they weren't, the reasons would be individual reasons, as with their Gentile neighbors. The cultural Zionists thought this belief an illusion. But they also, more importantly, thought it was a typically exilic illusion, another sign of the loss of self-respect. Emancipation was simply the latest version of subjection, a new way to defer to the Gentiles. Typically, it did not require a critique of religious belief. It was perfectly compatible with the faith of Moses, as this had been defined by the rabbis. But it did require the surrender of any claim to national self-determination. Akhar Ha'am's essay, Slavery in Freedom, is a bitter critique of Western Jewry, which had sold its heritage, in his view, for meager and purely private advantage. At the same time, the closed, narrow, vulnerable, and frightened world of orthodoxy in the East, the most visible form of the heritage, was no better. It represented slavery in slavery. Zionism aimed at an escape from both. This required collective action, cultural and political in character. But assimilated Jews no longer acknowledged the collectivity, and religious Jews would wait forever for God to act. Both these forms of exilic consciousness had to be negated. Zionist success was the work of new Jews who embodied this negation. There can't be any doubt about the newness, though there were plenty of old Jews in and around the Zionist movement. Nor were all the new Jews heroic pioneers working the land, as in Zionist legend. Nor were there all that many of them. Zionism was not a mass movement. It always had a certain elitist character, which derives from the fact that the negation of an ancient culture is not a popular cause. The vanguard of new Jews included political activists and even politicians, also soldiers, bureaucrats, managers, professionals, intellectuals, and farmers and workers. What made them new was that they did not accept rabbinic authority. They were not deferential to their Gentile Turkish and British rulers, and they refused to defer their hope for national independence. Akhar Ha'am had a very precise picture of how these people would, would work. First, they would transform themselves. Then they would create a spiritual center in Palestine. And working outward from the center, they would slowly transform the general culture of exilic Jewry. Then, slowly again, they would create a political center and ultimately an independent state. But this gradualist prospect was shattered by the urgencies of 20th century Jewish life. In the event, the vanguard created the state and won the wars that statehood required long before the cultural transformation was completed. Once the state was established, 
Its first task was the ingathering of the exiles. First, the surviving Jews of Central and Eastern Europe, displaced persons desperate for a place, and then the Jews of North Africa and Mesopotamia, living under threat because of the eclipse of empire and the rise of local nationalisms. The ingathering was a great success. Hundreds of thousands of immigrants poured into the new state. Its most dramatic effect, however, was to bring home the unnegated culture of the exile. So what Zionism in the diaspora had not accomplished, the new Zionist state set out to accomplish. The absorption of immigrants was designed as a process of cultural transformation. It represented the continuation of the earlier cultural war by other means. Ben-Gurion's description of what needed to be done, written before the establishment of the state, is instructive. This is Ben-Gurion. Absorption means taking uprooted, impoverished, sterile Jewish masses, living parasitically off of an alien economic body and dependent on others, and introducing them to productive and creative life, implanting them on the land, integrating them into primary production and agriculture and industry and handicraft, and making them economically independent and self-sufficient. Immigrant absorption was a form of state action, the work of civil servants, teachers, social workers, and army instructors. As Ben-Gurion's verbs suggest, the process was less persuasive than coercive. It was marked by a kind of authoritarianism, and it was, this became clear only later on, bitterly resented. It was also successfully resisted privately by many of the immigrants, and it is now publicly challenged by a revived and militant Judaism. Though important qualifications are necessary, I can tell a similar story about Palestinian national liberation. In this case, the liberationist militants have not yet won their battle. They are, at this moment, the protagonists of a failed, but not a definitively failed, political movement. One day, there will be a Palestinian state. But the encounter of secular nationalism with a religious revival is already well begun. And the surprise of the secularists at the strength of the religious forces is not much different in this case than in my other cases. Their inability to found a state no doubt fueled the religious revival, but it doesn't explain it. Had they succeeded, the secular nationalists would still have been challenged by an Islamic fierceness that they did not foresee. The liberationist leaders in this case never went to school with their imperial opponents. They did not study in England, and they never attended Israeli universities. But with the critical exception of Yasser Arafat, many of the earliest leaders of the Palestinian movement, because they were Christians and then because they were Marxists, did look at their own people from a significant critical distance. Militants like George Habash and Wadi Haddad, founders of the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, studied at the American University in Beirut, called themselves Marxist-Leninists, and were brutally critical of traditional Arab politics. It would be hard to overestimate the importance of Christian Palestinians like these two in the early liberation movement, and especially in its most radical and most radically secularist wing. Arafat is harder to figure out than the Marxist militants of the Popular Front, but in many ways he fits the picture of the nationalist leader that I sketched in the first of these lectures. Born in Egypt to parents who left Palestine in 1927, well before the Nakba of 48, he came to lead a people whose formative experience he did not share. As one of his biographers writes, he had no childhood home in the lost homeland, 
no plot of land which became the possession of someone else, no close relatives who were transformed into destitute refugees. For many years, he worked as an engineer in Kuwait, and it was there that Fatah was founded. The name is an acronym, but the word means conquering or victory, and it is often used to describe the early years of Islamic expansion. Arafat, according to all his biographers, was a believing Muslim and by no means a Marxist. The organization he founded, however, was secular and nationalist in character, inspired more by the Algerian FLN and the writings of Franz Fanon than by the Quran. To the true believers of Hamas, Arafat was a typical secularist committed to the establishment of a national state and not an Islamic state. His successors are no different, enemies, therefore, who must be replaced. Let me return for a moment to the general version of the story. Many successful national liberation movements produce, without intending to, an underground culture, a secret traditionalism, nourished by memory, carried by the family, sustained in religious conventicles and in life cycle ceremonies. The protagonists of this culture pose as citizens of the new state, they attend its schools, they serve, or some of them serve, in its army, vote in its, in its elections, accept the benefits it provides without ever allowing themselves to be refashioned in its image. They don't become the new men and women that Ben-Gurion and Fanon celebrated. They don't become modern, secular, liberal, democratic citizens, and their first allegiance isn't to the nation state but to something more like the traditional pre-state community. And after a time when national liberation has receded in memory, the traditionalists stage a counter-revolution. <coughs> Thus, the rise of Islamic radicalism in Algeria and in Palestine and of Hindutva in India. Their resurgence is a great shock to the national liberation elites who had grown complacent about the victory of newness. At the same time, however, the traditionalists are not really as close in spirit or creed to their ancestors as they like to think. They may not be liberated, but they are changed by the experience of liberation, often in ways they themselves don't understand. So the outcome of the counter-revolution is uncertain. In any case, it lies beyond my reach here in these lectures, for the Indian, Israeli, and Algerian stories are still unfinished. The return of the negated brings with it a militantly religious nationalism, which has radically altered the politics of all three countries and of Palestine too, but hasn't yet overwhelmed or defeated the liberationist project. The return of the negated is a general phenomenon, but it's also peculiar to each case. So let me focus again on the Israeli peculiarity, uh, well, on the Israeli case with its peculiarities. When exilic Jewry comes home, it brings with it a characteristic politics. This may be concealed for a time behind a facade of conventional citizen-like behavior but it is possible nonetheless to describe its basic features. I, I have to note at this point that I'm not discussing here the arrival of the Soviet Jews in Israel who had been modernized and secularized by communists, not by Zionists, and who don't fit neatly into my schematic account. The politics of religious, especially of ultra-religious Jews in Israel follows from the experience of exile and is obviously more closely continuous with that experience than Zionism is. Many of Israel's Jewish citizens do not really think of the state as their own. They may be fierce nationalists, but they don't have the sense that citizens are supposed to have of being responsible for the whole. They don't recognize a good that is common to themselves and all other Israelis. They retain a view of the state characteristic of a stateless people, 
always outsiders, always vulnerable. They are political opportunists seeking to seize whatever benefits the state provides and escape its burdens exactly as they did with better reason in Tsarist Russia. The fellowship of democratic citizens and the freewheeling debates of democratic politics are largely alien to them. They participate in an older fellowship. Zionism for them, as Amnon Rubinstein has written, is not a return to the family of nations, but its diametric opposite, a new polarization between the Jews and the Gentiles of the earth. The Arab-Israeli conflict gives this polarization a special force, but the view is general. All the others are hostile and threatening. The whole world is on one side, and we are on the other, wrote an Orthodox rabbi in the 1970s in what is really an astonishing misrepresentation of the condition of his country. Otherness on this view is always close and always dangerous. It includes the world of secular Jewish enlightenment as well as the world of the Gentiles. But all this represents only one side of exilic political consciousness, the side of deference, fear, and resentment. The other side is represented, is what I called millennialism in my first lecture. The other side is represented among the Jews by the figure of the Messiah, whose coming was in the long years of the exile indefinitely deferred. The insistence that one must wait for the Messiah and the rabbinic ban on forcing the end obviously support the political culture of passivity. On the other hand, the abiding certainty that he will one day come, the intermittent, unforeseen, inexplicable intensifications of expectancy, the appearance of false prophets and messianic pretenders, all these suggest a deep dissatisfaction with that culture. Messianism is simultaneously a comforting fantasy and a great disruptive force. Secular Zionists exploited this force, even claimed sometimes to embody it. But in fact, they naturalized it. They tamed it. They made Messianism into hard work and redemption into a gradual process of acquisition and renewal, another dunam, another goat. But once the mundane work was done and religious Jews beheld the state, especially the state as it was in that ominously magical moment of 1967, triumphant over its enemies. Many of them decided that they, that they did indeed live in messianic times, or better, on the very brink of messianic times. National liberation had brought them this far, but could go no further. Now the Messiah waited only for the zeal of the faithful to express itself in political life. Like the Zionist pioneers, the faithful would settle the land, but they would act in fulfillment of divine command, not of secular ideology. And they would live in accordance with divine law, and then the glorious days would begin. Fundamentalist enthusiasm is the most visible and frightening version of the Jewish counter-revolution. It enacts the old exilic understanding that redemption is the only alternative to exile. But it is also, at the same time, a radically new politics. It lays claim to state power. It exalts military force, both of which exilic Jews had always identified with the other, as many ultra-Orthodox Jews still do. But Messianism in modern Israel, as in the history of the exile, is likely to have a short life. It is infinitely susceptible to disappointment, disillusion, and new postponements. And post-67 Jewish messianism has already, I think, begun to fade. The real challenge to Zionist liberation comes from a strange, and as contemporary Israeli politics suggests, only partially consummated merger of messianic militancy with the coming out and the rising assertiveness of the traditional culture. Since this was a culture born in statelessness, its political enactment in an actual state 
is often strident, confused, and contradictory. Its protagonists are at once fearful of the non-Jewish world and hostile to it, anxious and aggressive. They are opportunistically committed to the state, re reliant on its military strength, eager to use its coercive power on their own behalf, but they are quick to deny the legitimacy of the state's elected and even more its judicial representatives whenever they don't like official policies. They are nationalists with a ghetto mentality, parochial, besieged, and belligerent. It's very hard to figure out who benefits from this kind of nationalism. Marxist analysis isn't of much help in this case, as I suggested yesterday it might be in the Indian case. Certainly, Israeli capitalists do not benefit from this religious zealotry. The rabbis benefit. Their authority is enhanced, and right-wing populist politicians find new opportunities. The post-67 settlers obviously benefit, at least in the short run, but they are the creation of zealotry, not its cause. No one else's position is likely to be improved or strengthened. Can Jewish zealots and traditionalists exercise effective power in the modern world or sustain a modern economy or negotiate with Israel's neighbors or find a way to peace with the Palestinians? Can they govern justly in a state that includes large numbers of non-Jews and larger numbers of non-believing Jews? My own view is that these questions cannot be successfully answered from a position of traditionalist militancy. Ultimately, the counter-revolution will fail. Though the militants may play significant roles in present and future governments, a modern state with anti-modern ministers, a formula for trouble. How is such a thing possible, given the success of national liberation? In fact, Zionist responses to the eruption of messianism and the return of traditionalism have been surprisingly weak. The chief intellectual reason for the weakness, there are also political reasons, is the double failure of cultural negation. On the one hand, the old religious culture was not overcome. On the other hand, the new secular culture isn't thick or robust enough to sustain itself by itself. Trying to explain the return to pre-emancipation days, his phrase, the literary and social critic Aaron Meged says simply, every vacuum must fill up. That isn't really fair, since Zionist writers and activists did a great deal to fill the cultural space left by the negation of the exile. The new culture was partly a reflection of the history of the movement itself, but it also reached back to the Bible and outward to 19th and 20th century liberationist ideologies. Arthur Hertzberg has said of Zionism that its ultimate values derive from the general European milieu. But it nonetheless produced its own ideas and institutions, heroes and holidays, ceremonies and celebrations, songs and dances. All this was very powerful for a couple of generations. It hasn't had much staying power beyond that, however. The social reproduction of secular Zionism has faltered badly in the last few decades, and Meged's claim that there isn't anything there has acquired greater currency than it deserves. But if a vacuum doesn't exist, there is, as I suggested yesterday, a thinness in the cultural air. And there may be a connection between that thinness and the radical negation with which Zionism began. One important consequence of radical negation is the force of the secular religious dichotomy in Israel today. Secular describes the people for whom the exile has indeed been negated, Religious, those for whom it definitely hasn't been, who sustain the old culture in the new state. It seems that there are no middle terms, no compromised versions of negation, no liberalized versions 
of the old religion. Perhaps Zionist Biblicism was intended as a kind of synthesis of the religion of the ancient Israelites, though not of exilic Judaism, with modern secularist ideology. The connections forged through historical study, archaeology, exploration of the land, secular adaptations of biblical holidays, and much else. But there was something artificial in all that, given the actual history of the Jews. The leap to the Bible, Gershom Sholem argued in a 1970 interview, is purely fictitious, the Bible being a reality that does not exist today. In any case, the leap was only to the most politically useful biblical texts, and it invited counter leaps to different texts. There is a line in Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice about this sort of thing that resonates with recent Israeli experience. The devil can cite scripture for his purpose. Of course, the Bible is a Jewish text, and a critical engagement with it could, and sometimes did, produce interesting arguments. But I want to suggest an alternative to this Zionist search for a useful past. I don't do this with any confidence that the alternative could have been realized in the history that I've just described, but it might still have some relevance for the future. What national liberation required was a critical engagement with the post-biblical Jewish tradition, that is, with Judaism itself. Sholem argues that Zionism was constituted from its beginning by a dialectic of rebellion and continuity. The rebellion takes the form of secular negation, and the continuity is embodied in traditional Judaism. These terms are certainly contradictory, but they haven't been brought into a dialectical relation. That is, a relation in which each influences the other, and the two are transformed in some interactive way. What sorts of moves from each of the two sides might make their interaction possible? I can speak only from the side of secular rebellion and try to answer, as it were, one half of that question. How might a critical engagement with the tradition strengthen liberationist culture? In the fourth and last of these lectures, I will lay out a tentative response to that question, and I will also suggest that the question has close analogs in contemporary Indian debates about the future of Nehruvian secularism. But before that, I need to deal with Marxist and post-colonial critics who deny that there is a paradox of national liberation, who insist that the question at which I have just arrived is not the right question, and who argue that the strengthening of Zionist culture or Nehruvian secularism is not a desirable goal. I'll take up that line of criticism in my next lecture. Yes. Yeah. 